Uh, my name is Martin Garris and I'm uh, Chief Exec of Cambridge Clean Tech. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't, uh, don't know me already, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mention a few points um, on housekeeping uh, and then just say a few words also about how Cambridge Clean Tech have been responding to uh, the pandemic in support of uh, businesses in the clean tech and the impact uh, sector uh, before then handing over to our speakers who you uh, really come to listen to. Um, so a couple of points um, on housekeeping. If you can please remain muted uh, during the course of the um, event. If you do have a question, then please type it into the chat box, which is in the centre of your console, um, up at the bottom of your uh, screen. And I will raise it uh, with the speaker if, as we go along, if it's particularly pertinent, or if not, we can leave it until the uh, Q&A at the end. Um, so that's for, for questions. Um, also, um, just be aware, please, that we are recording uh, this event, so it will go onto our website uh, for the event uh, later on today. And um, with us on the call, we've also got uh, Sylvie, Cynthia, and Oriane, uh, just to keep an eye on uh, technology and making sure everything uh, works really good. Uh, and at the end, just depending on numbers, we may well just carry on in this format or have a, a couple of coffee sort of breakout rooms if they're um, if they're needed, but just see in terms of numbers. Um, so that's it really for housekeeping. Uh, what have we been doing at Cambridge Clean Tech to help um, companies in the clean tech sector and the impact sector over the last uh, six months? Um, well, we focused on um, projects and areas which our members think are, well, they tell us our priorities, um, and also initiatives which we think will help them respond to the impact of the pandemic and help them to climb out of uh, where we are at the moment. I mean, they, the government grants have been helpful, uh, but they're not going to be around forever. So what we've been focusing on um, then are two aspects of support. Uh, first of all, uh, meet the buyer opportunity with, uh, with corporates. So if you take a look at our website, you'll see half a dozen examples of what we call innovation hungry corporates that are searching uh, for solutions from uh, clean tech companies, so sustainability sector solutions. A half, a dozen, half a dozen on the website at the moment. The most recent one is from Cambridge Display Technology, uh, which is actually part of Sumitomo Chemical now. Uh, they grew out of the, um, one of the labs in uh, Cambridge University at the end of the 90s, and eventually were taken over by uh, Sumitomo Chemical, essentially becoming their R&D uh, development division for EMEA, uh, basically. And they're seeking renewable energy and battery storage technologies. So if you have any companies or if you're a company that can offer solutions to them uh, do let us know follow the process on the website and we'd be happy to, uh, to put you in touch uh, with them uh, then the second area we've been looking at is access to finance another priority uh, of our members so we've run a number of uh, webinars on uh, providing access to uh, finance for businesses in the clean tech uh, community we've generated a great deal uh, of interest and alongside that, we've also made sure that our regular fortnightly e-shots have been kept right up to date with the range of opportunities from the, the government grants and the pandemic through to uh, various competitions and other new initiatives from the BC community, all of which focus on support for providing access to finance uh, to members. And I can also let you know that later this week, we'll actually be promoting our next Clean Tech Venture Day, or well, it's actually going to be a Clean Tech Venture Week, um, towards the end of November. And we'll be um, putting out an invitation to uh, innovators to put a pitch deck together to present to a room full of investors who'd be interested to hear about what they have to say and come to a conclusion as to whether they uh, wish to invest in some of those companies. So very much about contract opportunities and access to finance for our members. Because we, think, uh, we think that is the way uh, that companies can respond to and climb out of the, the problems that uh, many of us are facing during the pandemic. So that's a bit of background on what we've been doing at Cambridge Clean Tech, but without any further ado, let's move on to what we're here to talk about this morning. And I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, to our first uh, speaker, um, Morgan Pierstoff, um, who's the Business Development and Sales Director at Newable uh, in the UK. And Newable as a company helps businesses to thrive through funding, uh, professional support, uh, and also the provision of uh, premises for, um, for businesses. And Morgan's also, uh, she also heads up the America Made Easy business development team at uh, Newable. So I think that's ideal for her to be our first speaker this morning, and just to set the context for opportunities in 
terms of expanding into the USA. And Morgan, over to you. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Martin, and the rest of the team for, for putting this on. Just going to share my screen now. I think everyone can see these slides. Is that, uh, if that's going all right here and get us going? There we go. Um, excellent. So, so yes, this is me. I'm going to be the first of uh, three speakers that we've, we've got up here to really provide some helpful points across, um, as Martin said, mapping a U.S. expansion. And um, we know that those that are on the call are likely all at very different points, um, but we're going to be raising a number of different topics which are going to be of interest uh, either earlier on in your journey or, or later on. And so we really hope to provide some some points to get you thinking about what you need to be doing to be successful. A little bit about my background. Um, I have uh, worked the past seven years in, uh, in state and federal level in the United States, um, working to attract foreign direct investment to the U.S. Also worked in, in Germany for a number of years doing that um, and have been on the, the Nubal Vitas team now for approaching a year. I am based in London. Our uh, offices at Nubal are, are near Barbican. If you all are are not familiar with us, um, but I have familiarity working with, with international investors and investors in the UK, understanding um, you know, some of the, the pitfalls and challenges that they're facing in getting set up in the US. Um, now, we have formed a, a joint venture to, to help companies really take the hassle out of setting up a US expansion and, and help them understand um, how to de-risk it in many ways. So I'll be speaking about that. Um, and my colleague, Frank Levine, will be speaking after me. So we're gonna provide some different perspectives to how to go about this, um, but we're very much working together to make it easier for, for SMEs. Um, so a little just about Nuable. I'm not sure if, if you all will be familiar, obviously Martin gave a little bit of background. We're squarely focused on, as is Avitas Group, which Frank will be speaking about in more detail, on helping SMEs grow and to thrive. Um, you might know us, uh, we were formerly known as, as Greater London Enterprise, London Business Angels. Um, we have a lot of different programs that we operate to help SMEs. Uh, in particular, entering new markets, something we've been doing since 2005 in partnership with the Department for International Trade. And we help um, well over uh, 12, 13,000 companies annually enter new markets. But of course, the logical next step uh, in many markets is a physical presence um, or setting up an entity or some other step to get further traction in the marketplace. And at that point, companies all have the same need. They need to scale, they need to scale quickly to set up those back office functions. Um, their companies are gonna need to conduct business in those markets. So that's really the purpose of why our joint venture came together. We wanted to extend to UK firms all of the support they need in the US market in particular was scaling up with both people and processes. And the idea being that we're uh, really extending a lot of local expertise to companies um, to be sure that you're staying compliant across what is quite a complex regulatory environment in the United States, uh, in part because of the nature of the federal system, which we'll be talking about. Um, but uh, I'm going to just dive in a little bit into the why. So our why at New Bolivitas is really to help you simplify your expansion uh, and your business processes. We do this for domestic companies in the United States anyways, uh, but we're also doing it for international companies. That's really our why is to make that easier for you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. And your why is very much along the lines of the opportunity in the U.S. market, which is, of course, what we've got up on the screen now. Um, of course, there are tremendous ties already uh, with the U.S. and likely why many of you are interested in the marketplace. And yes, there clearly is a tremendous amount of opportunity because of the, the size of the consumer market in the U.S. Um, and, and because it's already the largest export market for the U.K. Uh, so so we, we, we understand that being your why as to, as to the focus on the market. But we also don't want that to, um, to really take over some of the challenges that you do need to keep in mind as well. So while the opportunity is great um, to really be successful in the, long run, in the long run, it's important for UK firms to be aware of what they need to do in terms of crossing their T's and dotting their I's and being compliant in the marketplace. So I'll just touch quickly on a few of these items um, and considerations that we see a lot of our clients making over the course of their investment journey. So on the culture side, I think we all joke about the similarities and the differences between the UK and the US, uh, but there are some things that really stick out. The US market uh, has the highest uh, spend in terms of marketing budgets and branding and that type of thing. So 
if you're going to be doing a U.S. launch, it's really important to think about what your spend is in that area to be competitive against your peers in the U.S. market. Um, so if, the, if you haven't had a, a conversation with um, on the ground experts about how to reposition your brand or what you need to do in terms of your digital campaigns to get traction against competitors in the U.S., that's something every U.K. firm needs to be thinking about. Customer service. Um, as Americans, you know, we've got uh, 50 other states that we can travel to. It's a big country. And that means your average American isn't necessarily traveling abroad. Uh, so the customer service, you have to think about um, what the expectation is for an American. They might be put off by having an international number that they have to call or not having on the ground support. So sometimes, you know, growing your market share in the US is going to mean having local support. And of course, you're going to need to get the right talent in place. So many of you might be listening in because you've already realized that's something you need to get in place. We help a lot of companies with recruiting and working across those cultural challenges and recruiting Americans that are going to be the best talent for your project. Scale, of course, is something that um, takes a lot of attention. We have, you know, well over four time zones you've got to consider. Uh, oftentimes, the East Coast, for a variety of reasons, is um, a good starting point in the U.S., but there are many other reasons as to the location you might actually choose in the U.S. It's going to differ based on your business model, but you've got to be thinking about how to interact with your team on the ground and, and biting off a piece that you can chew in terms of the market. Um, the economy of California is slightly larger than that of the United Kingdom, so it's a it's a huge market. There are 11 states larger than the um, than the United Kingdom itself in terms of land mass. Um, so a lot of regional dynamics at play. Um, some places in the U.S. where you can be a big fish in a small a small pond because there isn't only one market in the U.S. Um, in the digital space or the healthcare space. So it's important to think about those things. Compliance is really where we're coming in. Um, when you think about having 50 states and you think about the regulatory frameworks that vary from state to state, there's a lot to comply with. And that can be really complex for a small business owner. At Newable Vetus, we're really on your side to help take the complexity out of that, to make you aware of where you have liabilities and how to be compliant with those state jurisdictions. So um, that's just a quick highlight of some of the challenges, not insurmountable, but having someone on your side to help um, really tackle this is important. That's what our joint venture um, is doing. We have a team across the United States. We do business in all 50 states. Uh, and really we're trying to work with you to provide a turnkey solution. As you'll see, I'll be talking about a lot of different support services we have for companies uh, expanding into the US so that you can go to one provider instead of uh, a dozen. Uh, we have, again, around a dozen offices across the United States, California to New York to Florida. We have in-house accounting, tax experts, um, every back office need you might have, we do in-house. Again, trying to keep you compliant to make you aware, okay, based on your sales and to X state, you now have a reporting burden there. This is the filing deadline. All of these things that you need to take care of that as a small business owner, you perhaps don't have the time to do yourself. And all together, this is creating a really low risk way for you to have a partner to enter the market with. There's a couple of ways that we do this with companies and that we see to be most of interest. And I'm gonna talk about those quickly. One is really um, in, in the sense that you are just um, really validating the market opportunity. You know that there's a lot of potential, but you don't want to set up a U.S. entity quite yet. And the other would be more of a full expansion when you know that it is the right move to go ahead and set up an entity. In the first instance, um, we have our validation pilot solution, which works well for companies that are perhaps just looking to uh, really follow up on sales leads in the market, um, have someone that can go out and visit with customers potentially in normal times, go to trade shows, that type of thing. So this is really a solution to work with you to both recruit an individual that meets your needs, um, to hire them, uh, and to take care of their tax liability. We do this by hiring them under our entity, which means you don't have to set up a company in the U.S. yet. And that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility for de-risking your U.S. investment while you're still in these early stages of exploring the market. We do this for companies um, just on a monthly fee basis. It creates a really simple solution for you to scale quickly in the marketplace. On average, it takes us about three to six weeks to get an individual on the ground for you from the point at consulting about who the right candidate might be for you to recruiting them, to hiring them under our entity, where we take on all of the reporting and tax liability. So you have someone that you manage on a day-to-day, -day, but the back office is all taken care of. There's also a lot of flexibility with the validation pilot because it allows you not only to try out the market, 
If things don't work out, you can easily put it on hold or wrap it up without any additional commitment uh, because you haven't established an entity. Um, but also it allows you to try out the employee. If at any point during the relationship that employee is not working out, we can terminate them and re-recruit an individual at no additional fees. So uh, we hope though ultimately things go really well with the pilot and that you do at that point want to move forward with setting up a US entity. Uh, in the case of that, what we do is we work with clients to go towards that option two, which is a full US expansion. You could be listening in and think you're already here, you know you need an entity in the US. And once you establish um, a business entity to transact business in the United States, there are a lot of other requirements that you've got to consider. We've listed these out, which are essentially 12 roughly business critical services um, that we support companies on in this way. Um, I'll touch on, on several of these which stand out. Um, of course, consulting with you to understand exactly where is the right location in the US market for you. Some companies make the decision based on their supply chain, um, based on a critical customer, uh, based on market opportunity. Uh, generally, they don't make that decision based on incentives um, because all things equal, incentives are great from states and you should leverage those to your benefit but you've got to be sure that the business case is sound for the location first before you let that sway your decision. Other people, it's a lifestyle decision. If you're relocating, maybe you do want to be in a warmer climate and you decide to go to Florida or something like that. We see that happen as well, but we can help you understand what the tax consequences are of setting up in one location or another and establish that entity and file all the paperwork for you, both with the state and the IRS to get all of that going. Um, we have in-house, as I mentioned, tax accounting, a marketing team, um, insurance, all of these key aspects of operating a business um, that we can help you navigate. Um, most immediately when you set up your US company, you'll have uh, reporting requirements at the state level with the secretary of state in that state, um, but also you'll need to be filing tax returns at the federal and state level, whether or not you have revenues for that year. So that's something we do for a number of different companies is do their annual tax filings. Um, insurance, something that very quickly after you set up a company, you're going to want to consider getting a general liability policy in place. We help a lot of companies understand exactly what they might need to be um, really de-risking their investment in the U.S. based on whether they have a physical office or whether they just have an employee that's in the market um, visiting customers. We can advise across that. Setting up your U.S. chart of accounts. Um, it is different accounting system, so you might need someone to give your books a second look to do account reconciliation. Um, all of these elements are quite important with the back office, as you can imagine, but talent is really reign supreme. If you have a great product and you don't have the right people selling it, you're gonna have challenges. So we work very closely with a number of firms to um, both recruit the individuals in the marketplace. We have a, a full, um, a sizable in-house recruiting team that can support you as much or as little as you like on the recruiting process, but also man the full aspects of HR. So if you're looking for someone to take care of your payroll for your employees, but also provide them benefits to manage um, HR issues and, and um, to deal with safety and risk management, workers' compensation insurance, which will be required to have in the United States, we do all of that on behalf of companies, um, really freeing you up to focus on what you got into business to do in the first place and letting us keep you compliant and uh, providing all that back office support that you need. I'll just quickly um, uh, really conclude my portion of the remarks to touch on timelines. Um, every company listening is gonna have their own timeline and it's important to plug in these kind of operational decisions within that. So keep in mind that you can move pretty quickly in the US, but there are some things that um, just take a little bit longer. Banking in the US, if you're looking to get a bank account set up, we help a lot of clients with that. It can take longer, particularly in the, in the current circumstances. It can be anywhere from two to three months. Creating an entity is fairly straightforward and can be about four to six weeks. So we ask that you keep these in mind and, and we really try to keep our clients aware of what they need to be doing across these elements. Um, but to move forward with um, speaking more about how we engage with clients and case studies, Frank will be speaking more about that. But I think I'll pause now and see if there have been any questions that maybe have arisen about what I've shared thus far. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. That's uh, clearly a, a, a great setting of the, uh, the context of doing business in the USA and also a very good overview indeed of uh, the services that you provide for a sort of a soft landing for companies looking to establish themselves um, in the uh, markets in the USA. So thank you very much for that. 
Um, I can't see any questions at the moment, but um, come on audience, don't be shy. Uh, type something into the chat box if, uh, if you have something that's on your mind, and we can certainly pick those up in the Q&A um, at the end. But as um, Morgan was just indicating, let's move on then now to have a look at some real life case studies of companies that have expanded into the market in the US. And to take us through that uh, will be uh, Dr. Frank Levine. And Frank is an independent director uh, covering EMEA for the Avitus Group, which is the other half um, in relation to Muable in terms of this uh, joint venture to support companies going into the market uh, in the USA that Morgan mentioned. Uh, Frank is a C-suite uh, chief executive and he's got a collaborative style incorporating a very broad skill set and a range of experiences developed against uh, a global international backdrop. He's clearly demonstrated success of operating effectively at both the director and CEO level. So, Frank, you have to live up to that now. Over to you for some uh, case studies. Thank you. A little bit shamefaced that my photograph looks belies my, 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 my current white hair, but I need to get a, a fresh shot. But uh, thank you for the introduction, Martin. I, I suppose what I would, I would really emphasize is that I'm a dual national and I'm a Brit as well as being a US citizen. And I have actually worked in the States and I know what it's like to sort of uh, live and work there and get set up as a, as a business person as well as and a professional as well as a family man. But also I have worked, as you mentioned, I've worked in a number of different markets around the globe. So hopefully I can bring something to bear that's um, of, of interest in terms of relevance and connectivity. If we go to the next one, if you'd be very kind. So um, I've been working with Avertus myself for about five or six years. And um, so working with the UK, within the UK and indeed in Europe, helping European companies establish a direct investment in presence in the United States. Avidus has been around for more than 20 years, a well, well-established American firm with head offices now in Denver in Colorado. The operational hub is in Billings in Montana. And we've got some 3,000 companies we look after, largely domestic US companies, but also an increasing number of international companies from all over the globe, a very large number from the UK, but also quite a number now increasingly from, from Europe. And we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, our services, as, um, as was touched on by, by Morgan, uh, allow you, we, and our intent is to allow the companies to outsource non-core functions to the likes of us. And that, that allows you to do three things in a way that we believe is strategically important. It allows you to simplify the business by letting go of some of the, the workload that otherwise would distract you when you really ought to be focusing perhaps on building the business. It allows you to strengthen the base of the business through, again, focus and concentration. And that it becomes a really effective platform for for growth and revenue and revenue development. In the, in the United States, we have um, a team of 400 um, that are entirely available, uh, a team that covers a lot, a lot of the functions that it was mentioned by Morgan, um, tax, finance, and, and accounting, for notwithstanding marketing and, and what have you. But the key, issue, the, key, the key point here is that we have a, a professional team that, that across the entire piece of services that was touched on by Morgan, they can be brought to bear very effectively and very quickly. So uh, once you start talking to us about you know, wanting to plan an entry, we can help you pull together a team, of, a team of colleagues that can talk to you about where you're at, where you want to get to, and develop a customized approach uh, to, and a comprehensive level of support that you might well need in the short to long term. I did touch on the three legs of the stool, the simplification, strengthen and grow the business. This is the corporate mantra of, of Avertus. And, in the simplification bucket, if you like, we've allocated, we've allocated three particular functions we think make life more simple. If you were thinking of entering the States and wanted to de risk the entry, uh, payroll administration is something we've been doing for many years, for over 20 years, we're very expert at that. And that's, that can be a, a, not, a, not a very high value, high value function for yourself to, act, to be to preoccupied with, but letting it go to a third party makes sense in freeing up management time, leadership capacity. Accounting is another crucial function the, the accounting system in the united states is different and we're very we're very capable and willing to work with your trusted advisors in the uk if you've got an accounting firm you want us to work with we have an accounting team i think of 60 sitting in the uh, in, in in between the billings and the um, and the and the denver offices tax planning and preparation all again part and parcel of this simplification element and again um, planning your tax liability preparing for the future um, being tax smart, 
we can help you with all of that, both at the federal level, indeed, at the local and state level. So you maximize the, um, the advantages you can get from working with professionals like ourselves who have experience of working across all 50 states. We have, we have a very good expert, level of expertise and know-how about what are the requirements in each state in terms of tax planning, as well as gap compliance, which is the US accounting algorithm that you need to bear in mind, which we help you through. The strengthening the business, co-employment, again, this is a very important um, and perhaps a novel service you don't normally see in the United Kingdom, where we will put uh, the employee on our payroll and take care of the compliance issues. We make the payments every two or four weeks and, and we keep that person um, straight in terms of HR issues. We pr produce a handbook for each, each state that the person, personal person might be located in. But again, it allows you to focus on inspiring the person, leading the individual, if they're a recruit from the US, while we take care of some of the HR and personnel and administrations using old language to, to, to keep all the pieces in the right order. So you can again focus on, on growth. HR, I mentioned that a moment ago. Safety and risk management is quite crucial that we will uh, we'll help you do an audit of your, your operational uh, wherewithal. So when you come to, look, when you come to uh, explore, as you will do in 80% of the United States, workers' compensation is required. We can ensure that you get the very best rate in terms of premium because we've done the work up front to make sure you're in a good place in terms of getting the very best cost-effective insurance in place to put, put, to, put, to, put to bed safety and risk requirements. Um, growth um, in that particular part of the equation, on that third leg of the stool, recruiting is crucial. I mean, I think we will talk about the challenges of bringing people over from the United Kingdom to the States with visas and immigration status being what it is in the USA. It's even more vital that you get um, your head around and for me, it's a very exciting piece of the puzzle that we've, we actually resolved for is finding really high quality staff. In the United States, uh, we have, we, we have a, a huge database and we have an excellent recruitment team that can find folks from any particular, any particular vertical, any particular sector, um, a very capable group of individuals, but also they can, they can be drawn from any particular state. And I think putting the right person in place is absolutely crucial in any organization. I think Martin touched on it as Norm Morgan did, but to grow the business, you need the right people in place, particularly if you're looking for local hires now more than ever. Branding and marketing, we have a, we've, we've actually brought together, I think if not mistaken, three agencies in the last couple of years that we brought into the fold uh, for both that allow us to deliver digital services above the line, below the line for both consumer type products and business to business type marketplaces. And again, you can't necessarily, in fact, it would be very unwise just to try and lift your UK marketing collateral and expect to be able to export it, so to speak, into the United States. It does need to be socialized uh, for, for the US cultural set that is different. We speak the same language, but as was touched on an earlier a moment ago, you need to be cognizant there are cultural differences that need to be attended, not only across the pond, but in, within the United States, there are regional differences that you would need to be, take into account. And last one, at least under the growth uh, element, is information technology. You have the wherewithal to provide a 24 seven disaster recovery support, which is you know, very, very extensive and high touch. Or if you're just landing in the States and want some mobile devices, some desktops, desktop support, we can do that as well for an individual who's landing from, from the UK or even someone recruiting on your behalf. So this is a very interesting schematic. It's a bit of a roadmap really. It shows you the 12 steps, not necessarily sequential, but you need to, um, uh, take into account really not necessarily in this particular order but it's a very it's a very uh, helpful sort of way of looking at what you need to do and we actually provide all these services in large measure the only, the only thing I would say the two cabinets are we're not a bank obviously but we will help you set up with a bank introduction we have banking relationships across the states with Hong Kong Shanghai bank for argument's sake for example I know they're, they're very strong in the UK might be your bank which makes life a little easier Silicon Valley Bank Wells Fargo and so on so uh, that's one part that we, we would we, we partner and also we partner particularly on visa and immigration. Will is here to talk about that. But we, we'd like to think we, we've drawn all the pieces up for you. You haven't going to get overlapping relationships in place and sometimes conflicting opinion. We try and bring everything together under one roof so you get um, good advice that's all joined up and makes sense. And, and it's a, at a price point that you'd, you'd appreciate. It's not a, a big four price point. It's a price point aimed specifically uh, for um, SMEs. Now, I've been uh, charged with talking about three, three of the cases that or the lessons learned from three businesses we've helped bring into the States. And um, 
One is in fashion, uh, the other two are in the food business, and, one is, and the other one is in training and development. Two are from the UK and one is from Poland, but um, the common thread in all this is that we are in a position to uh, help across all sectors, all verticals, and indeed we, I've, I've just we cherry-picked two or three here, but there are many we brought, we've on board in the last five or six years that since I've been working with the, with the group, you know, I'm very proud to say. But the back of the services we provide are very, there's a commonality of, of, of need, if you like, whatever type of business you're in, everyone needs an accounting function, finance function, tax taken care of, and so forth. So it's, it's rather, it's rather um, we're generous in that sense, but it plays the strengths of our business, which means we can help everybody in, in large measure from whichever sector they might come from. And indeed, in any part of the United States where they may want to locate, because we have the experience of having staff currently on our payroll. In, in every one of the 50 states in the United States. So in both senses, we'd like to think we're well equipped to help you. Let's take the first one. The first case study was House of Hackney. Um, we helped them de-risk their, uh, their US entry. Um, we kept them compliant. We helped them with tax and their insurance. Um, we also made introductions to quite a number of other providers. And I think particularly we helped them with co-employment and setting up their New York gallery was quite crucial in good time. It ultimately was featured in the Vogue magazine, and we got a very nice, um, a very nice sort of endorsement from the from the CEO that we they wouldn't have been able to get where they wanted to get to without us being in hand to help steer, steer them in the right direction. But what you'll find here, and with the other two lessons learned, is that we started with, if you like, getting them actually set up in the states, landing in the states, setting up an an entity, and and, and opening a bank account, and what have you. But a lot, of, a lot of services that are on offer, those 12 I mentioned, you don't necessarily mean you have to take them all at once, but they are a suite of services that can be taken advantage of as you go through the, the growth development phase. And as you can see with this particular lessons learned, they started in one place and we built over time, a variety of services were brought to bear, help them develop their US presence. Now the, set, the second uh, lesson, lessons learned or case study, client success story, is reci recipe products again. Um, here, uh, they, were, they were at the outset selling really, as many do in the United Kingdom, remotely using e-commerce. And the US quickly became their largest market remotely from, from the UK. Uh, they, they'd actually put US resellers in place that, and, and they were doing quite well, but they felt that they couldn't really take full advantage of the United States unless they themselves established a presence. They wanted to be in control of distribution, or to be in control of the margin in a better sense, because you obviously give quite a bit of margin away if you're working with US resellers and you're not actually in the driving seat on distribution. So we helped them set up a company in the States when they were ready and again facilitated the bank account opening. They used our co-employment services to hire their first employee, which has been a great success. We then managed started to, to evolve into other services that they wished to, for us to be um, supportive of. Tax was a crucial one and accounting later on. So again, we were able to advise them as they expanded their footprint in the United States and Michael Versky was Berksky was very pleased with our, our, our efforts there and um, it's a nice result for everybody. So um, as you can see, the, the endorsement is quite straightforward, but um, it, it's different from the early one, but there are some similarities, the early lessons learned. The third lessons learned is really around a uh, learning and development company um, that's not in the UK. Uh, as in, I met these folks in, in Warsaw, in Poland, and uh, again, started out with small steps. Um, we got them a US company established, a tax ID from the government, their federal employee identification number, which is quite straightforward. As they grew out, they grew their business. Uh, we took over their tax and accounting needs. And um, as you can see again, uh, Radoslaw is, is saying some nice things about how we helped him with the co-employment service, the, the, the manage the payroll, the benefits administration. I mean, we touched on that, but provided them with, with work, not only workers' compensation, but also medical insurance, life insurance for their team. In being able to recruit top quality folks in the United States, you do need to have a good benefits package, and we were able to put that in place for them. We have an insurance broker that was touched on earlier that was uh, leveraged for that purpose. And they, they, they've actually took a great number of our services over time as we built to understand each other and re responded to their needs, not only HR, workers' comp insurance, safety management, were all handled by us. and. Um, they actually started with one employee, and I think if I'm not mistaken, I think we're up to nine or ten. This is nine here, but maybe a bit more than that even now. But that's uh, you know that is a, there's another another lessons learned, another success story that it can be done, and you can de-risk. It's not it's not a big mountain to climb if you lay off some of the 
the non-core functions to the likes of an avatar. So, uh, Frank, I'm um, just conscious of time. Are you just wrapping up now? If that's okay. Yes, I will. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, here are the, here are the four um, the four elements, um, and um, just very, without much ado, we help set up the company, help you establish a US firm with the, with with the US employees. We can establish a US firm and help you hire a US team, and then streamline the the, the function. So. Uh, we can all the functions here are you know whatever market entry plan is right for you it can be one two three or four we can focus on those and and bring it to bear that's relevant to you we normally have a discovery call at the very outset we, we get us a, a better understanding what you want to do and how you want to do it we want to get to and we agree the steps with you we have a pre-consultation help you design the entry plan support you might need over time and start um putting together you know the the, the foundation pieces for a successful entry and launch they'll hold you hold you in good stead and be sustainable in the long run so that's how we make it happen excuse me running a bit on there martin i'm being a little bit long-winded but that's I think okay that, 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 that um, i think that sort of takes us to q a again yeah no that's terrific um i think those case studies in particular just bring everything to life you know there's a real companies that are expanding into the usa with your support so thank you thank you very much for those frank um, again, just conscious of time, and I see we haven't had any written questions, so I think we'll leave those to the Q&A at the end. So, um, delighted now to um, announce that Will, Will Dias, who's a senior associate attorney at Fragoman, is going to take us through everything to do with visas and um, related regulations for entering the uh, US market. Uh, Fragoman is an international immigration firm which is headquartered in New York established way back in 1951 and specialised in providing a range of immigration law services to corporate and individual clients. Certainly I believe Will works right across uh, from SMEs through to the corporate. So over to you Will to take us through the visas in what is quite an interesting time for you I guess at the moment. Uh, yeah certainly is. Um, so I, I, I suppose usually with these presentations what I'm basically doing is explaining how easy it is to expand to the US uh, COVID-19 has changed that substantially. So what this will mainly be based on is, is more or less the rudimentary question of, can I even go to the U.S. right now? Or can I even get a visa to go to the U.S.? Um, as far as the administration goes and the recent changes, what we've seen is we've seen kind of three layers of restriction. And what I'll do is I'll walk through those restrictions. I'll discuss some basic strategies. And I'd say that the kind of main takeaway here is that uh, I'm not in the business of saying don't apply for a visa or hold off on applying for a visa, but in a lot of cases here, companies are having to defer their expansion or delay visa applications uh, just based, because, uh, based on kind of the, the challenges in place. Um, so the idea is oftentimes people will have to look maybe in the next few months to local talent or even local hires if they can't uh, deploy people internationally. Um, Obstacle one, uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, is that after the, the pandemic began, there was kind of a, a cascading of travel suspensions into the U.S. from various countries. Uh, as it currently stands, uh, there are travel suspensions in place uh, for anyone present in the last 14 days in the U.S., the U.K., Ireland, the Schengen area, Brazil, Iran, and China, excluding Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, what does that mean? That means that a British citizen sitting in the UK right now uh, can't normally just board a plane and get to the US, whether they have a work visa or whether they have ESTA. So uh, who does it apply to? It applies to people physically present in those countries, excluding permanent residents of the US, uh, people with what are called green cards, also excluding US citizens, obviously. Um, when will these travel restrictions and suspensions end? Uh, there's no clear answer to that. Um, it's something that uh, remains an open question, and it's something that we've been watching very closely. Uh, keeping in mind that Europe has a, an inbound travel suspension on the US right now as well, uh, the expectation is just generally as things ease in the US over time, uh, that travel will open up, um, perhaps on a country by country or region by region basis. Um, and again, that, that is something that we're watching closely. There's no, no clear answer. Um, Next thing here is that there are exemptions to this travel restriction. As far as those exemptions go, this is where the strategy comes in as far as if you need someone on the ground in the US, uh, what are the workable options? So um, first things first, uh, people who are family members of US citizens or permanent residents are actually exempt from the travel suspension. So for let's say a British business, uh, if you have someone on the books that you wanna to send to the US and let's say they have a US citizen spouse, 
uh, even though that has nothing to do with your business, uh, they may be able to, for example, are likely able to enter the U.S. on a business trip just based on the fact that they have a U.S. citizen spouse. Even U.S. citizen siblings or children uh, can serve as a basis to go around this travel suspension. So um, if, if it does come down to someone needs to go to the U.S., you may be doing an inventory of, of basically who has, who's married to a U.S. citizen or who, who has a child that was born in the U.S. that can basically just exempt someone, let them enter uh, under a business exception uh, or under a family exception. Um, as far as other things here uh, with this exemption, there are certain areas where it doesn't apply. Uh, if someone is uh, entering the U.S. at the invitation of the government of the U.S. government and the government's national interest, if they're a diplomat or, or an air crew member, people like that are being allowed in. But by and large, people even authorized to work in the U.S. or otherwise holding a valid visa can't currently enter the U.S. from the U.K., from Ireland, from the Schengen area. Um, next thing here, can I just circumvent the suspension uh, without an exemption? Uh, the answer to that is actually yes. And what does that actually look like? Since the, the, the six, this suspension applies to people present in one of the listed countries in the last 14 days before traveling onto the US, if you're just not in one of the listed countries in the last 14 days, you can enter the US. So to give you an example and what some clients have done, uh, if you wanna take a two week vacation in Cancun, Mexico, uh, and then fly to the US, uh, that's one way around the suspension. Um, we've also seen clients, for example, uh, park in, the, in Turkey for two weeks. Uh, my understanding is that they've recently uh, kind of lifted the travel restrictions into Turkey. If you're able to, for example, stay in Istanbul for two weeks and then fly onto the U.S., that may also be an option. Uh, it's difficult to advise or recommend these options per se because you are still placing yourself in a country during a pandemic where lockdown rules, uh, travel rules, security situation can change without notice. But again, it is possible to circumvent by going to a country that is not listed or not subject to the restrictions and then entering from that country. Um, as far as just kind of final point here, there are also kind of formal waivers that are in place for people entering on, in the national interest. And this is another way around the travel suspension. Uh, since the travel suspension was uh, implemented in, in as early as January and through March with various countries, uh, this national interest uh, exception to enter the U.S. has proven to be very much based on those directly addressing the COVID problem, people doing medical research, uh, physicians, uh, people involved in the pharmaceutical industry. They've also been granted special permissions to enter the U.S., whereas people just making baseline economic arguments to enter the U.S. have been mostly rejected. Um, there's been some easing around that, and this is kind of a final point that's very much hot off the press as of last week. Uh, the U.S. government is starting to suggest that people entering in certain visa categories for business purposes uh, may be able to get an exemption. Uh, it's very unclear as far as what the outline of that will be exactly. We're still waiting on guidance that we should have in the next one to two weeks. But uh, the overall idea here is that uh, those present in the U.K. currently, most of Europe currently, can't simply get on a plane and enter the U.S. Uh, they need to fall under an exception. If they do fall under an exception, they may need to uh, basically show up to the airport early with a copy of their marriage certificate to a U.S. citizen, a copy of their U.S. citizen spouse's passport, and basically kind of point to it and say, well, I actually can get on the plane. Usually we're seeing people are being able to board when they're doing that. But again, this is a travel suspension in place till further notice. Uh, some exceptions are starting to pop up, but again, still very much in place. Uh, next thing here, so in tandem with the travel suspension, there was also since mid-March a closing of all U.S. embassies and consulates for regular visa processing. What does that mean? That means that uh, most people cannot apply for a visa. Uh, Brits, for example, uh, are visa exempt. They can travel to the U.S. with ESTA, but you have the travel suspension in place stopping you from doing that. Those who actually have to work in the U.S., do regular, empl uh, regular employment, investors, people of that nature, um, are required to secure a visa to be lawfully present in the U.S. and work, and the embassy has simply been closed uh, for months. Um, what this has resulted in is a lot of pain for my clients, primarily because a, a client had an appointment in March on a rolling basis. Uh, they gave a notification, all appointments in March are canceled. They then rescheduled for April, all appointments in April are scheduled. We have clients that are basically repeatedly rescheduled and, and have faced uh, continuous uh, cancellations. 
Um, as far as the closure of embassies and consulates, there is some good news. And that news is as of last week, they made an announcement that they're going to start phasing a phased reopening of embassies and consulates so people can actually apply for visas. Uh, while that sounds promising, uh, the main issue here is that it will be on a country by country basis, uh, consulate by consulate basis. And there's certain visa categories that they're just not interviewing for or, or likely to interview for immediately. Uh, the most notable is what's called the L1, the standard intercompany transfer. It looks like they may be slow to bring that visa category back for interviews. And that's something we're watching closely. We expect to have some more clarity on that in the next one to two weeks. Um, I'd say as far as this goes, uh, with this restriction, the one thing I put here is adapt to the restriction by planning. I would say that there's two ways around that. Uh, or two ways to address that. Um, first one is that uh, people who already have visas uh, and if they're, pre if, if they're entering the US or able to enter the US around the travel suspension, or if they're present in the US when all this came into place, they may be able to file extensions of their immigration status while present in the US. So there has been some flexibility there. Also, I've had clients who, uh, let's say that they're not subject to the travel ban. Uh, they enter on a visitor visa. They've entered uh, on a visitor visa, allows just business meetings. They've then been able to file for a transition to a work visa category after entering the US. So while the embassies and consulates are not issuing visas, those who currently hold a visa are able to enter the US around the travel suspension, uh, may be able to switch over to a work valid status and actually work in the US. Um, the idea with kind of these, these, uh, these options is that these aren't easy options. Uh, they require a lot of logistical planning. Uh, they require a lot of analysis on my end and also on the end of HR at my clients to determine uh, who has a visa, who's able to travel, where are they currently. So again, um, main idea here is that there are ways to get into the US, there are ways to get into work valid status, but a lot of people may not be able to avail themselves of those options. Um, final thing here, and this just kind of adds to the pain is that not only uh, have they uh, instituted a travel suspension, largely closed embassies with only limited reopenings, um, they also decided in June to restrict L, J, and H-1B visas. Um, what does this mean or what is the significance of this? This isn't actually a health-related measure. This is essentially the Trump administration looking at unemployment numbers and saying that they want to restrict the entry of foreign nationals into the U.S. on the argument that they will take American jobs. Um, who, does, who does this apply to? Uh, well, L1 or intercompany transfers, uh, your managers, your executives, your specialist employees who are entering the U.S. after working outside of the U.S. for the business. Uh, the J1, this is kind of an intern visa, not very, very pertinent to this call. H1B is kind of your uh, rank and file visa for hiring uh, new hires in the U.S. who are foreign citizens, usually requiring a bachelor's degree. So um, this, this is a, a, a kind of a, a blanket prohibition on issuing and processing of these visas until the new year. Companies that were relying on L1 for intercompany transfer and uh, are making their initial steps into the US have often or, or basically had to delay entry into the US uh, because they're unable to secure visas. Um, as far as kind of just final points here, uh, there are options around this as well, uh, choosing different visa categories uh, based on nationality. Uh, for example, Brits and many other countries are able to apply for what's called an E2 visa, uh, assuming the company holds the same nationality as the applicant, majority British-owned company with a British applicant. So we're looking into other visa categories as things come back online for the remainder of the year. But again, it does remain very uncertain. Uh, the main point here is that anyone looking to enter into the U.S., especially as an initial entry, should remain very flexible. Uh, things that do matter, nationality, uh, whether people that you're looking to send to the U.S. currently hold a visa. Uh, for example, a current L-1 visa holder may be able to renew an L-1 this year while a, a new L-1 applicant is unable to. So it's, uh, it's a question of analysis case by case. Um, we'll also share a link. Uh, I think it might be shared right now or it'll be shared with the final email. Uh, just because Fragment is hosting a, an online guide that's uh, updated in real time. And what that basically does is it just covers uh, all country conditions and, and current restrictions in place. It's kept up to date. So it, it will probably be a good resource for the people who have joined today. Uh, and with that, I suppose if there's any questions, I, I can take them now or, or at the end of the session.